welcome to much more on medicine on Think Tech live streaming network series, broadcasting from our downtown studio at Pioneer Plaza in downtown Honolulu. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Joining me in the studio is attorney Natalie Pettit. Today we present how workers' compensation works, believe in possibilities, not disabilities. Remember that our talk shows are streamed live on the internet from 11 a.m. to 5 o'clock p.m. every weekday, and earlier shows are streamed all night long. All our shows are streamed on livestream.com. If you want the links to our live streams or previous broadcasts, which are available on youtube.com, or if you want to just subscribe to our programs or get our mailing lists and get our program advisories, go to thinktechhawaii.com. I'm delighted to be talking with workers' compensation attorney, Natalie Pettit. Natalie is a former prosecutor in the U.S. Army Judge Advocate General's Court. In 2003, she served in Iraq as the legal advisor for the Commander 24th Corps Support Group. She came to Hawaii the following year as the Chief of International and Operations Law with the United States Army Pacific. For more than a decade, Natalie has concentrated her law practice in the field of workers' compensation. Natalie, so as a work comp attorney, what do you do? I review a lot of medical records. So workers' compensation is uh, essentially insurance that employers are required to provide so that when they have workers that are injured on the job, their workers are taken care of. Um, because it involves work injuries, it's really heavily intensive on review of medical records. And so I spend a large part of my day reviewing those matching facts with the law, with uh, existing cases, to see how we can um, get injured workers the medical treatment that they need and get them back to work as quickly as possible and in the most cost-effective manner. I know as an insurance defense attorney myself that I do review a lot of medical records. And I think people think that attorneys, we spend all of our time on the law. But I know that in my practice, I do a lot of arguments related to medical issues. Is that what you do as well? That's exactly what I do. Um, so we have to know the case. We have to know the records in order to make sure, again, that we're getting the injured worker the treatment that they need. The law requires that we provide reasonably necessary medical treatment for the work injury. As you can imagine, and I'm, I'm sure you might see this um, in some other cases as well, that when um, there is an injury to a particular body part, sometimes that um, injury then spreads to other body parts or other body parts become to be involved in the claim. And so it's just very, very important to have a good grasp of the medical history of the person to look for any pre-existing conditions, any subsequent intervening injuries, um, and just to find out what's going on with the case. Okay, so what are the most popular types of injuries that people receive or the most common <laughs> in, um, in work well, I don't place think, environments? I don't think any injuries are popular. <laughs> <laughs> but we do see um, certain injuries quite frequently. And those involve low back injuries uh, for the most part, some neck, um, repetitive injuries such as carpal tunnel syndrome, um, lots of shoulder injuries, elbows, knees, that type of thing. OK, so one thing that I've noticed in my work is there tends to be um, when I said popular, sometimes there are injuries that seem to be more common during particular time periods. And I've noticed that years ago it was um, TMJ disorder issues, and now it's traumatic brain injuries. Have you ever seen a trend in the type of injuries, or does that not exist in your work? Uh, we see different types of injuries across the board, and that hasn't changed, but I think as more research is done, we do see an increase in traumatic brain injuries in PTSD. There's been a lot of research done. As you know, I was in the military, um, so with um, soldiers coming back from war, there's been just a lot more research done in that area. And they're finding, obviously, that it pertains not just on the battlefield, but it can happen in other areas as well, including work injuries. Um, so that I have seen an increase in those types of injuries. Now, um, OK, so what is workers' compensation? 
So workers' compensation, again, is insurance that an employer is required to maintain. They can either be self-insured or they can have insurance. And if they're self-insured, they have a third-party administrator who administers any work comp claims for them. If they're insured, then they just have an insurance adjuster uh, that does that. And, you know, these, um, a lot of times I, I hear people complain and gripe about the insurance carriers. But the adjusters who are working on the files, they live in our community. These are our neighbors. These are the people of, whose children go to the same school as ours. We see them in the library. We see them in the grocery store. Uh, they're part of our small community here on Oahu. And I, my experience with the adjusters is they really, really care about their jobs. Some of them are very busy, so you'll, you'll find that when you're working with them, that they do have a quite a, a busy caseload, but they care. Okay. And I know you're very busy, and so we appreciate yes. you <laughs> taking time out of your day to be here. Um, what exactly does work comp cover? So if a person is injured at work, a workers' compensation insurance will cover any medical treatment that they may need. It covers wage replacement, so there are temporary disability benefits that an injured worker may be entitled to. If someone is off of work completely, that equates to two-thirds of what their normal pay would be, what their average week weekly wage would be, but it is capped by year. So once you reach a certain threshold, it stops. Um, so injured workers can sometimes earn far, far less on work comp than they would ordinarily. So that's another incentive to get back to work quickly. Uh, it also offers permanent disability benefits if there's a permanent impairment at the end of their treatment. If there's disfigurement, it offers monies for disfigurement. And in certain cases, if they're not able to return to their usual job, uh, it can offer vocational rehabilitation as well. Okay, and so if someone is injured in work, at work, what do they do? The first thing they would need to do is immediately report it to their supervisor. Uh, the employer is required to file what's called a WC-1 form within seven days of becoming aware of the work injury. So that gets the ball rolling with the Department of Labor. If the injured worker is concerned that the claim has not been filed by the employer or uh, there's a delay of some sort, they can file their own WC-5 form and that will also get the ball rolling at the Department of Labor. Uh, from that point on, the insurance adjuster will handle the claim and, and just work with the injured worker on finding out who their medical provider is, what medical treatment they need, and get them on track to getting healthy and getting back to work. Can they go to any doctor? They do have a choice of doctor that they go to. The department also allows a one-time change of physician if the injured worker is not happy with the doctor that they initially selected. After that one time, though, then it does require approval either by the insurance adjuster or by the department. And the reason for that is we just don't want people doctor shopping. OK. And where do you come in? I usually come in um, only in extreme cases. So usually the adjusters, as I mentioned, they're very hard workers. They, they know their job. Um, they get it done well. And they're very kind, caring, giving people. They can normally handle the mass, vast majority of work comp claims. The only reason that I come in is if there's uh, for some reason, a more serious injury that requires attention, a more complex case, or there's concerns about malingering or something else not going quite right in the case. Maybe it's not moving on the tra tra trajectory that would normally be expected. And so a lot of times I'll be called in to review the file, um, just have a clean set of eyes on something to see where the case is at and how we can get it moving. Okay, so. If someone just hurts their back, a typical thing, they're picking up something at work and they have a, a lumbar strain sprain, which is basically a low back injury, um, what do you usually expect to see in the course of their um, uh, treatment and rehabilitation? If it's just a lumbar sprain, I would expect that they would go see their doctor right away and perhaps their doctor would work with them on getting some restrictions. Um, for their current job, if it exceeds their physical limitations, so they might have some weightlifting restrictions or be able to sit and stand throughout the day, um, depending on what's going on with their condition. Uh, this is hopefully to help rest the injured area. And then also we would expect to see some medical treatment, maybe a little bit of physical therapy. Uh, sometimes we do see massage, acupuncture. There are various um, 
modes, methods that work for different people. So we see those a lot early on in the case. After several months though, and usually red flags start popping up around the six month mark for me, if someone's condition is not getting any better, then it's a signal to me that something else is going on in the case. Either they've not been diagnosed correctly, perhaps they need some diagnostic tests to rule out maybe they need a, a shoulder surgery or, or some, some other treatment that they're not currently receiving uh, in order to get better. But I would expect that those passive modalities that I mentioned would kind of run their course after about six months. And at that point, the injured worker should be able to go back to their usual job. Okay, and so would chiropractic fall into that passive modality? Absolutely. Okay, so now, and so it's okay if they get passive treatment rather than active treatment, like passive meaning chiropractic, massage, acupuncture, when someone is doing the work on the injured person rather than them actively doing the work like with physical therapy? Yes. Okay, and so is there a limit to the amount of passive treatment that they're allowed under work comp? So it's really on a case-by-case -case basis. There's no set limit, um, but as I said, we do become concerned when it starts to go on for an extended or protracted period of time without any signs of improvement. Uh, that, that becomes an issue that we want to look at, and I would assume the injured worker would want to look at it as well because the goal is, is to get better. Okay. So. Um, what is the standard? Like they have to show that uh, that the treatment is medically necessary or what is that the standard or is something else? Sure, so the statute provides that it has to be reasonably needed for the work injury. Okay. And that standard is a, a little bit loose in its interpretation and I think it naturally has to be because all injuries are different, all people are different, uh, people heal at different rates. And so there is quite a bit of, of flexibility. Uh, we do see, however, for example, since we have been using back injury as an example, we'll see people go in for treatment for back injury. And then when we start looking at their medical records, we'll see that the chiropractor is also treating the neck. That becomes problematic for us because that is something that should be billed. If there is a problem, something that should be billed under personal medical as opposed to the work injury. So it, it really takes quite a bit of time to sift through and, and sort all those things out. Does the claimant has, have the burden of proof to show that the treatment is um, uh, medically needed? The claimant and the medical doctor that they're working with do have to show that the treatment is reasonably needed. So once a provider, an, an attending physician for the injured worker, determines that certain treatment is needed, let's say chiropractic treatment, for example, they would have to submit a written treatment plan to the adjuster for review. The adjuster has seven days to approve or deny it. Sometimes they simply request clarification. They need a few questions answered as to why the treatment is justified. Um, so at that point, if it's not approved, they'll send a letter to the doctor saying, hey, we would like you to answer these few additional questions. Um, and it's denied pending your answer to these. Right. And, you know, honestly, it, nine times out of ten, the, the doctors don't even respond to us <laughs> so the treatment is denied and the person left holding the bag then is the injured worker who's not getting the treatment that they need okay and um, so um, is that do you come in there where there's a denial yes so I help the adjusters when, when I'm on a particular file I do help the adjusters review to determine whether treatment is reasonably needed uh, I'm not a doctor so we also rely very very heavily on the experts involved in the case will oftentimes retain what's called an independent medical examiner to review a file. And he'll review it, determine what the diagnoses are, um, and what treatment is reasonably needed for the work injury, and we'll kind of try and follow the outline that the doctor gives us. Okay, and I'll ask you a bit more about that after our break. And so um, we're gonna take a short break now. I'm Katherine Knorr, this is Much More on Medicine on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We're talking with attorney Natalie Pettit uh, about how workers' compensation works. Aloha, my name is Victoria and I'm a host at the Adventures in Small Business. This is a collaboration between U.S. Small Business Administration, Hawaii District Office, and its partners, where we showcase the stories of local entrepreneurs and small businesses, talk about how to start a business, talk about great tips for small business owners, 
Uh, please join us every Thursday, 11 a.m. at Think Tech Hawaii. Um, see you soon. Mahalo. Aloha. My name is Wendy Lowe, and I want you to join me as we take our health back. On my show, all we do is talk about things in everyday life, in Hawaii or abroad. I have guests on board that will just talk about different aspects of health in every, in every way, whether it's medical health, nutritional health, diabetic health, you name it, we'll talk about it. Even financial health, we'll even have some of the Miss Hawaii's on board and all the different topics that I feel will make your health and your lifestyle a lot better. So come join me. I welcome you to take your health back. Mahalo. We're back, we're live. I'm Catherine Noor, and this is much more on medicine on Think Tech live streaming network series, and we're talking about how workers' compensation works. We're with Natalie Pettit. And Natalie, what is an independent medical examination? An independent medical examination is a, an examination with an expert in his particular field that the insurance carrier pays for. Now, this does not mean that the opinion is bought or purchased or influenced in any way by the insurance carrier. It's simply that the carrier is requesting this and therefore they're responsible for the bill. The injured worker is not responsible for the bill because that would be unfair. Um, with an independent medical examination, there are a number of providers. We have some really, really excellent, excellent experts here on Oahu. Um, there are also some that are very, very um, conservative in their opinions. And so we usually try to exercise um, and get opinions from the ones who the injured worker can also have buy-in from and their attending physicians can have buy-in from. If they're represented by an attorney, their attorney can have buy-in from. Our goal with an independent medical examination is to identify areas where maybe some tests the injured worker hasn't had or some treatment that the injured worker hasn't tried to see if we can help improve their condition. Also, if there are any new ideas, a fresh set of eyes on something that can get the injured worker back to work, identify any problems or irregularities, um, and also to provide, as I, I mentioned earlier, one of the benefits under work comp is if there is any permanent impairment. And so the independent medical examiner will help rate the permanent impairment of the injured worker when the claim is ultimately ready to be resolved. When you say buy-in, are you saying agreement in terms of selection, or I'm not sure what you meant by that? Sure. So the statute in work comp provides that the employer gets to select the independent medical examiner. But in practice, our goal is to work with people to try and bring the claim to resolution. Um, so we don't want to make it an adversarial system where people are digging their heels in at, on both sides, at both ends. Um, so we usually do try and get agreement by the other side as to which provider they will see um, in order to move the case along. That way, as I said, both people feel like they're, um, they're being heard, that they have buy-in into the process, mm -hmm. and that way we can trust the result on both sides. Okay, and so do you find that um, the um, claimant and their attorney that they will agree with what the IME doctor has to say? It depends which attorney we're working with. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part, yes. Okay. Um, we do try and work together. We're a very small legal community sure. here on Oahu uh, in Hawaii, and we do try to work together. So we try and find mutually agreeable providers, and when we do, and that doctor renders an opinion, for the most part, uh, both sides, whether they like it entirely or not, are uh, willing at least to concede that the doctor is, is credible in his opinion and we use that in order to move the case forward and resolve the case. Okay, so uh, what about um, medication? I know that there is an opioid crisis in the United States. And is there a concern with opioid use in relation to work comp claims? There is a tremendous, tremendous concern. And it's not just a concern, it's a reality. So for example, there is a particular provider uh, 
who, in California who um, was convicted, actually pled guilty to workers' compensation fraud in California and um, ended up having to pay a, a, large, a large fine and was also subject to um, potential incarceration. That doctor is still practicing here in Hawaii. Really? Yes. <laughs> That's kind of scary. It is very scary. Um, and we see the same practices and trends in his case handling here in Hawaii in his treatment of injured workers that he was doing in California as well. Um, in addition, you know, I, one example I, I frequently use, it's been a couple of years now since I've had this case. Uh, it has since resolved, but it's such a sad story. We had a girl um, who was in her 20s, she's a young girl, and she sustained a simple back strain. She was picking up uh, a chair uh, for a display setup that she was doing. It was just an aluminum beach chair and moved it and sustained a back strain as a result. When I did a background check on her, she had prior convictions for drugs. So she was already at risk. Uh, she went to a provider and they started prescribing narcotic medication to her and she was not represented by an attorney, so I had the opportunity to speak with her personally. She shared with me that the doctor would hand her bags, this is her words, bags of drugs when she would leave his office. I tallied the cost to the carrier, and for one month supply, they were trying to bill $30,000. So I don't know what kind of provider <laughs> in wow. their right mind yeah. would send a young girl off with bags of drugs when she clearly has um, a propensity to not use them correctly. Well, okay, that is a horrible story. Yes. Um, what about um, providers who um, fill the prescriptions in-house? Is that a concern to you? That is a concern. Um, we have here in Hawaii so many options for filling prescriptions. You can fill them at the grocery store when you go grocery shopping. You can go to the drugstore. There are all sorts of pharmacies around. There's a lot of hospitals that have pharmacies that you can fill at. There are lots of available sources to fill prescription drugs. When a provider starts filling them in-house, that's a red flag to me. Uh, we oftentimes see that the provider is um, prescribing compound medications, which are mixed with just a slightly, slightly different formula. But because they do that, they can pull it outside of the work comp fee schedule and basically set their own price. Um, that becomes a problem. And we do see exorbitant prescription bills come in when they're prescribed in-house versus when they're filled at a pharmacy. OK, because there's a pharmacy on every corner around yes. here. So <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Indeed. Um, what about in-house drug testing? Because I know that you sometimes see that on treatment plans. What's we that do. all about? So it's fascinating. Um, people who are taking prescription medications, I think it's appropriate for them to have periodic random drug testing. Usually we see that. Uh, maybe once a quarter. Um, but with more emphasis being placed on prescription drugs and investigating the abuses of prescription drugs, we have seen certain providers begin to offer more drug testing in-house where they didn't used to offer that previously. And we're, trying, we're starting to see the same types of patterns where they will draw the lab work uh, in-house, you know, the, either the urine screen or if it's a blood screen, they'll do that in-house. They'll ship the sample off someplace on the mainland. And then when we get the bill for that at the end of the day, it's often much, much more than what it would have been had the injured worker gone to a lab to have the test done locally. But why would you test for drugs? Well, we test for drugs uh, for a variety of reasons. Number one, we want to make sure the injured worker is, in fact, taking the drugs that they're prescribed. Okay. Uh, and number two, we want to make sure that there's nothing else in their system that would be contraindicated that would cause a problem with their prescription drugs. So, for example, if someone is taking illicit drugs, cocaine or, or meth, uh, that's obviously something that we need to know. In that situation, we probably would have their provider stop the prescription drugs until they can get stabilized and get off of the uh, illicit drugs. Okay, so when you come into the, um, into the picture and it's a complicated situation, is there sometimes something about the case seems like there might be some malingering or 
that maybe they're, they're able to do things that they claim that they're not able to. That happens on occasion. I do want to emphasize, and I think we started the segment out initially, that adjusters and injured workers can mostly, for the most part, in, in the vast majority of cases, work together, and it's problem-free. So the cases I'm talking about now, uh, or that we're shifting into, um, are cases that are unusual. Mm. But you're right, they do occur. We do see some fraudulent claims, and we do see some malingering, and that has to be addressed. So we do monitor people's social media, and we do background checks. And if there's an indication, sometimes we'll get tips from coworkers that they're engaged okay. in certain activity. Uh, if there's an indication that they're exceeding their limitations, you know, if you're saying you can't um, perform your job and you need to be on disability because, um, let's say you have a back injury and you're not able to lift, but we see you out hiking and um, you know, engaged in, in some sort of vigorous activity or out fishing, you, know, you have a shoulder injury and you're out fishing, those types of things become red flags. Okay, and, and uh, we are running out of time, but I wanted to ask you to tell me what the most egregious situation you've seen like that was. Oh, my goodness. Um, I has, I'm, uh, hesitate to say, but we, we did have one girl who had injured her back uh, at work lifting a, a box, a heavy box of product. She worked at a bar, and she was lifting, I think, some tequila or something. I don't know. In any event, she was off work um, for the work injury. And, it, you know, actually, it, it was an injury to her neck, I remember, because she was constantly wearing a neck brace. Every time we saw her, she had this neck brace on. We discovered that she was working on the Big Island while she was on disability from employer as a pole dancer. And she was really gifted. We actually sent an investigator out there. He took one of her classes. She taught pole dancing. Um, they took one of her classes, filmed her the entire time, and she had some moves. <laughs> Okay, so, uh, and Natalie, what would you like to leave us with in terms of what we should take away from this about work comp? That the system is, should not be as complicated or as confrontational as it can sometimes be. It's really easy to work with people. The goal, I think, that the employers share and that the injured workers share is that we want to give people the medical treatment that they need in a timely manner so that they can get back to work and be productive um, citizens. Okay, so. thank you. Okay, we're out of time and we'll have to wrap it up. I'm Catherine Noor. This is much more on medicine on the Think Tech live streaming network series. We've been talking with Aunt attorney Natalie Pettit about how workers' compensation works. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you to our broadcast engineer, our floor manager, and to Jay Fidel, our executive producer, who puts it all together. Please join us for a future ThinkTech production.